And welcome once again to CRTV 131, Contemporary American Cinema. We are up to class 13, which means we are dealing with slightly younger directors that are still working and haven't been working all that long. The uh, career of a director seems to be quite a long one. Lots of directors work into their 60s, 70s, and even 80s. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock was uh, deep into his uh, 70s, and Akira Kurosawa, and Federico Fellini, and lots of uh, lots of the classics. And uh, we also have Steven Spielberg, who is closing in on a 50-year career, and Martin Scorsese. So uh, if you're looking for a, a career that will last you deep into your uh, deep into your old age, uh, being a director is actually a pretty good place to go. Uh, directors reach their peak rather late. Uh, certainly uh, nothing like uh, sports people or anything like that. A lot of directors seem to really peak somewhere in their 50s, 40s and 50s. Uh, and so today, young directors like Wes Anderson, uh, who are only in their 40s, and, um, and uh, I think Christopher Nolan's in his 40s, and... Um, and uh, not sure about Peter Jackson. He might be in his 50s. Coen brothers are in their 50s. But a lot of the top directors these days are uh, in their 40s and 50s, which is kind of, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of up there, really, for most other professions. Uh, the youngest director, I think, in our class is Edgar Wright, uh, or possibly Wes Anderson there in their uh, 30s, I believe. So um, we are going to start off with one of these uh, hot directors, been directing at the top of his game for maybe 15 years or so. That's Christopher Nolan, American director, and often dealing with themes of psychological, uh, of psychology, identity, things like that, certainly with the Batman uh, movies, the Dark Knight trilogy. And he has this amazing career that has been able to balance popular and artistic. And aside from Spielberg, I don't know how many other directors can make really artistic movies that cost a hundred million dollars. It's just so hard to do. It seems like you either have to do a big franchise movie or a small, tiny, little personal art movie. But to do a big movie that uh, is going to set a studio back 100 or 150 or 200 million dollars like Dunkirk or Interstellar or something like that or uh, is just really something and even his Batman movies uh, were uh, being looked at by the Academy uh, in terms of uh, Oscars and, uh, and that sort of thing and uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's the first uh, fictional superhero to win an Oscar, Heath Ledger as the Joker uh, but that's a kind of rare. Uh, usually the, the uh, awards, not just the Academy, but usually awards tend to go not to franchise-type movies. They don't tend to go to uh, sci-fi, fantasy, action-type movies. Mostly they go to, like, dramas, just regular old dramas. And that's uh, going back over the last uh, maybe 10 or so years. Uh, that is, uh, you know, Green Book and uh, Spotlight and... Uh, and uh, Movies like that, even uh, Parasite, uh, really just straight dramas. So this amazing career of Christopher Nolan. Uh, and Dunkirk was nominated, although it's not really a... Uh, uh, it's certainly a big movie and an action movie, but it's not anything like the very hard to sell, I'm thinking of the poor marketing people working at the studios, for a movie like Inception. So let's talk about the inception about inception just a little bit. Here is a movie that is about people getting into other people's dreams, basically, and and getting them to change their mind by having them do certain things and guiding them in their dreams. There's a whole dream world in there, and we have dreams within dreams, and I've linked to. Uh, one of them about uh, the dream world and explaining the dream world and all sorts of crazy stuff like five minutes in the in uh, the uh, five five minutes dreaming is like five hours in the real world and things like that all sorts of 
uh, crazy rules and things like that, and the only way to get out of a dream is to be killed in the dream, and on and on and on. Um, and that is a hard marketing uh, concept right there. How are you going to sell a movie like that? And even Interstellar, which is sci not uh, kind of sci-fi, but hard science, let's say. Hard science, he, he had lots of research and lots of input from real scientists talking about bending of space-time and black holes and all that. It was very scientifically rigorous. It wasn't a fantasy or anything like that, the way, say, maybe a Star Wars movie might be. Um, and so, you know, bending of time and all that and people traveling at the, near the speed of light and people being near black holes, aging much slower than the people back on Earth. I mean, this is a hard concept to explain and a hard concept to sell. Um, and by the way, if you if you like Interstellar, you might check out 2001 because there's another movie that's kind of maybe a hard sell um, and a, diff a very definitely a difficult concept. So here we have these kinds of movies and how uh, how can we convey the the excitement of this movie to an audience, and we don't want to trick them into seeing the movie. We don't want to say it's one thing and then and sucker them into uh, getting into the theater and then find out that it's a completely different movie. Um, I, I have noticed, and, and maybe you have too, but uh, a number of movies that are not in English don't show people talking in the trailer. And to me, that's a little bit of a cheat. You know, if, if I'm okay, if if you're gonna show a, a movie, if you're gonna try and advertise a movie where there are subtitles, then show me subtitles in the trailer. And uh, to me, that's that's uh, only fair. But I I know movies like uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which is a fantastic movie, and we're gonna talk about it in just a minute. But a lot of people were tricked into going to see the movie. They here's all this wonderful action, and then people get into the movie theater and. It's in uh, either Mandarin or Cantonese. I think Cantonese uh, for that movie, and that one's coming right up. And so I think when you're selling a movie, you should be honest, or the audience is going to be upset, and they're not going to be very forgiving, and maybe kind of angry, and maybe they're going to have things to say on social media and things like that. So uh, very definitely, um, I think marketing and selling a movie uh, should be you should be fairly honest. Uh, let me pick on just one more movie while we're talking about this, which is Quentin Tarantino's *Inglorious Bastards*. And the trailer for that movie makes it look like it's a rock'em sock'em World War II war movie. And I like Quentin Tarantino, and I like his scripts, and I like what he does. But it was not a rock'em sock'em uh, war type movie. It was much more of a psychological thing. There was lots of talking, lots and lots of talking, and and trying to suss out, uh, you know, the, 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 the spies and all that kind of stuff. And it was not the movie that was advertised. I was okay with the film as, as it was, but it was not the film that I thought I was going to see. And maybe you have uh, an example of a movie where you went to see it based on a rather um, uh, uh, dishonest trailer. Okay, um, anyway... And by the way, there's a there's a hilarious uh, uh, YouTube uh, channel, uh, Honest Trailers, and it's really a lot of fun. So you might uh, you might check that out. Uh, okay, so back to how are we going to sell this movie, and in an honest way, and one of the chief ways I won't say it's the only way, but one of the uh, chief ways is starring from the director of. Okay, or from the director of Starring. Okay, so here's Leonardo DiCaprio and in uh, Inception. And Leo's made some other... Uh, the, the other one I'm thinking about is uh, uh, The Revenant, where he's mauled by a bear at the beginning of the movie, and he ha he's, has to crawl back to 1830 civilization, uh, nearly dead. Who wants to see that movie? 
right? Who wants to see a movie about some guy mauled by a bear crawling back to civilization? But Leo's in it, and we've loved Leo since Titanic, really. He, he, we've loved him. He makes very good choices in movies. He hasn't really disappointed us. He makes very challenging movies. And so now we get a movie like Inception or The Revenant or something like that, or even a movie about Howard Hughes. And so that is partly why movie stars get paid uh, enormous salaries, because they can help open a movie. They can get people to go to see a movie they might not ordinarily want to go see. Uh, and big stars, uh, Tom Hanks, people like that, they can get people to uh, maybe take a chance. Maybe take a chance on something they might not ordinarily want to see. And here, also, from the director of, and with... Uh, uh, Christopher Nolan from the director of The Dark Knight. So, right, so we've got starring Leonardo DiCaprio from the director of The Dark Knight. There's a movie. There you go. That's how you sell, that's how you sell that movie. Uh, and let me just pick one more. The Martian. And there are no aliens or Martians in The Martian, strictly speaking. And this astronaut is accidentally stranded on Mars in the not-too-distant future. And before uh, he can be rescued, he's going to have to grow crops in his own uh, poo. And that doesn't sound like a real rock'em, sock'em, fun, alien, spaceship adventure movie. But Matt Damon's in it from the director of, uh, and that's Ridley Scott, so from the director of um, Black Hawk Down or Blade Runner or whatever, right? So, okay, that's... Sure, let's go see that. Matt Damon from the director of Blade Runner. Yeah, we, we can see that movie. So uh, that is partly why st studios, and especially marketing departments, love franchises. Because everybody knows it's it's another Avengers movie. It's another DC movie. It's a X-Men movie, right? We, we know the concept. It's a Harry Potter world movie, uh, The Wizarding World, uh, or James Bond. Uh, Fast and Furious, right? These movies are kind of pre-sold. That's the whole idea. They're kind of pre-sold and audiences aren't taking that much of a chance on seeing a franchise movie. You kind of know what it's what it's going to be. Sometimes you might get a brand like Disney, right? So Disney is, if it's an animated film, then it's, you know, from the Disney Studios. What more do you need to know? It's a Disney animated film. And for most people, sure, that's enough. Okay, I get it. That's enough. And that's partly why we have uh, genres. It's a musical, right? It doesn't matter who's... Well, if you like musicals, then it almost doesn't matter who's in it. It's a musical. Uh, Moulin Rouge or La La Land or something like that, but it's a musical. And if you like musicals or if you like horror or if you like uh, superheroes. So there we go. Uh, and Christopher Nolan has definitely put studio marketing departments uh, to work. They really earn their pay when Christopher Nolan does a film. And let me just go back uh, a little bit. Uh, something like Dunkirk, which sounds like a kind of a straight ahead kind of a movie. It's based on a rather famous evacuation. It's not even a battle. It's an evacuation. The British were in uh, Germany. They had declared war on Germany after Germany uh, uh, went after uh, Poland and France and, and, and so on. And uh, they sent hundreds of thousands of troops to Europe, just like World War I. There, there we are again, northern France, Belgium. And uh, let's do what we did the last time, only this time uh, the Nazis are much better uh, prepared and um, or motivated or something. And they totally overrun the British, and the British are pinned against the ocean, right? They're in northern France, their backs are against the ocean, and they are either going to get killed or captured, or can they escape? Okay, so it's not really a, a, a glorious battle that they're going to win. They're, they're going to escape, and the uh, troop ships need march much deeper water, than is available there at Dunkirk. It's you know it's a deep water thing. They need a regular deep water port. Uh, there isn't anything much like that, so they're going to have to get on smaller boats to take them out to the troop ships, and they know that time is running out very very quickly. 
And uh, so the British, they put a call to the public, to uh, civilians. If you have a pleasure craft, okay, take your sailboat, take your whatever, your yacht, not your, not your rowboat, but go across the English Channel, uh, the, I think it's 20 some miles, and pick up as many of our, uh, of our troops as you can. And they did, right? There were, and it's sort of a thing that all of the civilians there and along the coast uh, of, uh, of Britain, and they sent people across and they brought all these people back. So, okay, not a well-known battle in the United States. It's a big thing in, in Britain. They, they know that very well. Uh, that's not something that we know all that well. And so what does Christopher Nolan do to sort of make it his? Because okay, the story's been told. And so he's got three stories to tell, and the, each story takes a different length of time. One story takes a week, one story takes a day, and one story takes an hour. Okay, one, one of them is an airplane and the troops and things like that. So he is going to cross-cut all three of these stories. All three of these stories are going to get cut, almost like they're happening simultaneously, although the time frames are completely different. And it's an amazing job of somehow making sense of three stories that take uh, such drastically different lengths of time uh, to tell. So, uh, really good film. If you haven't seen Dunkirk, don't worry that it's a World War II movie or anything like that. Think it's a Christopher Nolan movie, right? Think it's a Christopher Nolan movie. That's the movie you're going to see. Don't, don't worry about the subject matter. And I know I've said this in class a number of times. Uh, for me, anyway, I see movies because of the director. Uh, sometimes the subject matter. Okay, that sounds interesting. It's, uh, you know, whatever, like sci-fi or something, and I like that. But a lot of times I'm like, oh, it's a Danny Boyle film. Oh, it's a Christopher Nolan film. Oh, definitely it's a Wes Anderson film, and uh, or the Coen brothers. And that's how I go to see movies. Uh, Quentin Tarantino, right? Martin Scorsese. I see lots of movies that I never would have seen under most circumstances because of the director. Okay, so... Uh, Christopher Nolan and Leo there. Next up is Ang Lee, and he is uh, Taiwanese-American. I've heard him speak, and I don't hear an accent, so he must have uh, arrived here in the U.S. when he was a child. Otherwise, most people tend to get an accent if they, if they uh, live the first uh, you know, 15 or 20 years uh, in one country. So, anyway, he is uh, an Asian director, and that in itself is kind of rare. Uh, we don't have very many. They're almost all this, this big club of, of, of white men, okay, a, a Caucasian European uh, men, very, very few women, very, very few African Americans, very, very few Asians, and so on. And so when we get a, a director who's not of the large group like that, when, when we get... Uh, uh, you know, an actual um, uh, Catherine Bigelow, an actual female director winning an Oscar, then we want to call attention to it. And so certainly Ang Lee, Asian American, and he has won two Oscars for directing, And uh, th but that's not the film we're going to do. Um, and uh, good that he won those Oscars. Fantastic, in fact. That's uh, the most that any active director has won is two. Uh, Scorsese or Spielberg, sorry, not Scorsese, Spielberg has two, uh, Clint Eastwood has two, um, but uh, I don't know if there are any other active directors with, uh, um, Oliver Stone has two, um, I might be missing one. John Ford had, had four, he's no longer with us and was directing in the 40s and 50s for the most part, um, and a few other directors had three, but these days two is a lot, and Ang Lee is in that very small group. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, as I mentioned, was a foreign language film. I believe it's Cantonese. I, I, if I have it right, uh, there are lots and lots of languages in China. The two big ones are Mandarin, which it seems to be kind of the official government language uh, because that's what they speak in the Beijing area, 
and uh, down near Hong Kong and Taiwan, I believe it's Cantonese. If anybody wants to send me an email and, and help me out, that would be fantastic. But it's not in English. That's the important part. And so when I went to see the movie, there was a sign at the box office that said Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is in Cantonese. It's not in English. No refunds. <laughs> I kind of had to chuckle. Uh, I can imagine that a number of people went to see the movie. Maybe they were tricked into seeing the movie based on the trailer and it, seeing some action movie. Then people start talking and there are words at the bottom of the screen and they weren't happy about that and they wanted their money back. So, um, the, the, and it, was a, it wasn't a little art theater, right? It was a, a chain, uh, AMC or, or, uh, or Regal or something. Um, but they were tired of giving back refunds, so I thought that was that was kind of fun. Ten Oscar nominations is a lot, a lot. I don't know, uh, very. Uh, I think the most is eleven or twelve, so that's right up there, pretty pretty high. And I don't know any movie with ten Oscar nominations uh, in the last few years or so. That's that's quite a bit. It won four, not for picture or director or actor, probably for editing. And cinematography, for sure. Those are those are pretty good ones. Um, and I don't know, maybe screenplay, uh, maybe um, score, something like that. Uh, and uh, he was uh, interested in doing that based on his, uh, you know, uh, native country, uh, China, and the stories he'd heard as a child, and uh, some of the movies he'd heard about, and so on. So he did a rather traditional. Um, what they call wire work film. In uh, uh, 20, 30 years ago, the actors doing their amazing uh, um, acrobatics uh, and so on, martial arts, would have been on very, very fine wires that you can barely see. Today, with uh, CGI, they're going to go in and erase the wires. So they want, they make the wires thick enough that, that the the CGI people can see them, so sometimes they make them out of bright orange or something like that, so they are easy to see, so that the technicians can get in there and erase them. It's hard to erase a real fine wire if you can barely see it. So, um, uh, let's talk about the other movies here, the, the two Oscars that he did win, Brokeback Mountain uh, and Life of Pi. Uh, I used to show um, clips from Life of Pi. It's a really good movie. It was based on a big best-selling book, and I think a lot of people uh, were drawn to the movie because of that. And it has uh, substantial CGI. It's a young uh, South Asian uh, teen, uh, Indian, and he is shipwrecked and... He ends up on a life raft. Uh, the boat was carrying the family zoo, and he is there with a few animals, and in a very short period of time, only the Bengal tiger is left. So it's just this boy and the tiger. Tigers are pretty hard to train. You can train them, but pretty hard to train, especially for a movie. So the tiger was done CGI, and it looks fantastic. It looks just fantastic. It's a... it's. Uh, a wonderful movie. I, I've linked to the trailer, and you'll see how gorgeous it is. Of course, it's made uh, on a on a soundstage in a pool with green walls all around and wave machines and all of that. Uh, but it is a uh, really good and thoughtful movie. And not to give too much away, but we have kind of uh, an unreliable narrator in there too. So uh, the ending is is. Uh, Interesting, let's just say. Uh, so CGI there, and then the long halftime walk of Billy Flynn. Uh, again, he's working with technology, and he did it at uh, HFR. If you see HFR, it means high frame rate, and movies are uh, normally done when they were shooting on film. Not too many are shot on film. We'll talk about that. Uh, at 24 frames per second, but some... Uh, directors uh, found out that if, if films were shot at a very high frame rate, then the picture just got even sharper. There is a almost undetectable bit of uh, flicker in uh, 24 frames per second, and so he was experimenting with 
uh, high frame rate and some CGI. He also did Hulk, the first Hulk. Um, and uh, Marvel has been trying to uh, make a franchise out of the Hulk, and it's frustrating them. Uh, Hulk is number two in the Marvel world for most people to Spider-Man. Okay, from 10 years ago, the most famous Marvel characters would have been Spider-Man far and away, and then Hulk, just like Superman and Batman, they were the two famous uh, characters. Not Iron Man, not Thor, not Captain America, none of that. It, it was those two, and Hulk is like Batman, and they can't seem to get a a franchise out of Hulk. He seems to work okay as a, uh, a part of a team, uh, but uh, for some reason the public has yet to allow Hulk to carry a uh, his own film. Um, so anyway, Ang Lee did the first Hulk. There was another one done very similar, uh, an origin story, another origin story with the radiation and all that stuff. And uh, also, Ang Lee did Gemini Man, and when we talk about CGI uh, in our next last class, uh, we have Will Smith playing, uh, be being de-aged and playing a 20-something year old version of his 50-something year, 50 something year uh, actual person. I didn't say that very well, but uh, today he's in his, uh, I believe in, in his early 50s, uh, but due to the wonderful de-aging technology, uh, is playing a, um, I don't know if he's cloned, I haven't seen the movie, I don't know if he's a sort of a cloned version or something of his, of his uh, uh, current self. So again, Ang Lee sort of working with the technology and, and that sort of thing. Okay, another director uh, that works with uh, technology is Peter Jackson. And he kind of broke the mold with Lord of the Rings, the third film in the trilogy, really swept the Oscars. It went 11 for 11, okay? And that was way back in 2003. It uh, won every Oscar it was nominated for, 11 for 11, picture and director. No acting, uh, but cinematography and editing and uh, sound editing and all that kind of stuff. And the interesting thing about that and the interesting thing about uh, the other Middle Earth trilogy that he made is that uh, all three of the films were shot all at once. So all of the actors were gathered together. They went to New Zealand. They shot for about a year because they are big movies. They are three hour long movies each. Uh, and then the director's cut. They're like almost four hour long movies. And so uh, it took about a year or so to shoot all three movies. Uh, you know, a big movie might take two or three months. So all, th all three were close to a year. And then they took the first movie and took a year to edit it and release it. And then the second movie, another year to edit it. And so that's how they were able to release these big, monstrous, very heavy CGI movies on a yearly basis, which is really unheard of. You, you can't make a big, giant, three-hour CGI heavy movie in a year, right? It's really pretty much impossible. So he did it twice and uh, it seemed to be a pretty efficient way to go. The actors relocate to, to uh, New Zealand. They don't have to do it, you know, and then go back two years later because they signed a contract. Um, so I think the actors maybe appreciate uh, that they can make these three movies and uproot their family and uproot their life just the one time. Uh, and uh, Andy Serkis is uh, really the go-to guy for motion capture or mocap, and he has done uh, so much of that, playing Gollum in three films and Kong in another, that he uh, uh, sometimes does uh, advisories and things like that, and uh, technical, uh, technical uh, advice and things like that for actors who are sort of new to the whole mocap uh, thing and uh, you know Marvel movies and all that they heavy on the on the mocap so so uh, good old Andy Circus good for him um, he's uh, starting to get into a little bit of directing uh, Peter Jackson let him do some second unit directing on the Hobbit uh, and um, and he sometimes he plays himself 
um, but he has done um, these uh, uh, interesting fantasy type figures like Gollum and Kong, and along with Kong, he also uh, did in Planet of the Apes Caesar in I think three movies too. So he's he's done uh, four uh, ape movies or primate movies. Okay. We have the new young adult franchises, and they are, uh, certainly a few years ago, they were really the hot thing. And I have mentioned in uh, a, a couple of times how allegory plays nicely in, um, in fantasy movies and sci-fi. Um, uh, even on television, uh, Twilight Zone, Rod Serling, he was all about allegory. Even Gene Roddenberry with uh, with uh, Star Trek, lots of allegory. Uh, you know, it, yeah, they look like space aliens, but really they're talking about race and, and that sort of thing. So in the Harry Potter movies, uh, you probably saw them when you were, you know, whatever, junior high, something like that. And uh, running kind of beneath the surface, and maybe when you're in junior high, you don't pick up on this stuff, but adults, uh, we might notice that, that uh, Voldemort is all about pure blood, pure blood and, and, and mud blood and, and uh, uh, you know, all of that. And so uh, really, he's kind of the stand-in for Hitler, you know, wanting the pure race instead of the pure Aryan uh, race. Uh, like uh, like Hitler, he's looking for the pure. Um, uh, I can't remember what they're called in general, uh, but the the magical right. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on that. Maybe somebody knows. Um, and uh, so there are half right mud, and 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 uh, Voldemort is not happy when people are half magical and half uh, human, and so on. So uh, anyway. Uh, uh, big chunks of money have been made from these young adult franchises based on books, uh, and we get the Twilight uh, series of movies, huge hits, and the Hunger Games, also very big, and some not quite uh, so big, uh, Divergent series and Narnia and Dark Materials, and there are quite a few more, and um, it's sort of like mining for gold, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's like a, a, a talent scout. Uh, reading books, right? This might be our next uh, big, our next big franchise. Just like uh, going to film festivals to find, uh, you know, directors of, of new films and things like that. There are people out there reading books, and especially uh, YA or young adult books, looking for that next big hit. Okay, edging up to practically the present day, Bong Joon Ho, Korean director, South Korea, I guess, um, and Parasite, and this is the very first film in all 90 plus years of Oscar history to win an Oscar, and um, and that is kind of a big thing. There have been so many wonderful uh, foreign language films and directors. Think of Kurosawa and uh, Seven Samurai, and think of Fellini, and... Uh, and um, uh, Ingmar Bergman and Antonioni. I mean, there have been so many amazing foreign language films, and none of them have won the Best Picture Oscar. Now, the Academy is headquartered in Hollywood, and, and for the most part, foreign language means not English. Uh, but it is a big deal. It r really broke a, a, a big barrier. Uh, the cinema is uh, very much a... a worldwide uh, art form. It's not, it, it was uh, really got kicked off here in the U.S. and, and France too, but uh, certainly the big guns were American, uh, um, American movies and things. It's sort of like the, 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 the best place, the, the NBA or the NFL, right? If you're going to be a pro, that's where you want to be. And Hollywood, I think we've talked about this. Um, and I also don't want to make too big of a deal. I know I've said this a couple of times. I don't make too big of a deal on Oscars. There are so many fantastic movies that haven't won uh, an Oscar. Like I, like I mentioned right there, Seven Samurai, a fantastic movie. 
who cares if it won the Oscar or not? It is one of the great films of uh, all times. So, um, again, don't want to put too much uh, on, on Oscars and all that, but it is a, a, definitely a sign of respect and kind of a sign of changing times uh, and so on, too. Um, and we're going to talk about how much uh, uh, money and profits are made outside of the English-speaking world in just a little bit. Okay, so uh, he uh, won the best uh, film and the best screenplay and the best directing Oscar. So he won three Oscars uh, that night. And um, he has worked in English. His English is uh, passable, but that's where uh, you're going to get budget money and uh, actors and things like that. So he did uh, Snowpiercer and Okja in English. Okja even for... Uh, Netflix, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and I've uh, linked to the trailer uh, for Parasite, and um, uh, and it's a good movie, right? You, it's very good. He's a really good filmmaker. It's a, just regular old drama. It's not uh, uh, sci-fi like uh, Snowpiercer or Okja. Uh, Okja, I think. I'm not sure. Okja, I'm not sure. I'm sorry about the pronunciation. Um, and there is a uh, very rich family, and they live high above the city on, on a hilltop in a beautiful, large house. And another family lives down, down, down at the bottom of the hill, down into the city. And they even have a, a uh, half-basement apartment, so they're only even half above ground, so they're literally up high and way down low, um, and how the one family almost becomes a parasite on the other family. Lots of twists and turns. I love that. And uh, if you haven't seen Parasite, check it out. Um, it is not in English. Um, and I, I, I might have mentioned this before, but almost all American movies that are seen, virtually all American movies that are seen overseas, are translated into different languages. If you're going to see a Marvel movie in, in, in Russia or China or Brazil, you're going to see it in that language. You're going to see it in Russian or, or Portuguese or, or whatever. And when we see movies from overseas that aren't in English, generally we see them with subtitles. And I have to wonder, really, you couldn't find enough money to translate this movie into English. Uh, in the old days, translating was not very good. It was almost laughable. Back in the 50s and 60s, when they were doing sort of low-budget drive-in type movies, uh, there, were, there was a series of Hercules movies in particular that were fairly laughable. But these days, the art of uh, dubbing is, is quite good. It's, it's really quite good. And the, uh, the uh, people that do that, the, I mean, the lips are moving. Uh, up and down. I mean, it looks like the right words are coming out, only the, uh, the actor's lips are moving up and down in English, and, uh, you know, Russian words are coming out of their mouths, and you'd almost not even notice. You almost wouldn't even notice. Uh, I, saw, uh, Peter, I saw Peter Jackson's King Kong in Thailand, uh, when I was visiting, my wife uh, is Thai, and we were married over there, and we have been over there a few times, and it was playing in theaters, and we wanted to see it, and I had already seen it, and I wanted to take her, and the next showing was in uh, Thai, and so I said, okay, let's see it in Thai, what the heck, and I tell you, it looked to me like Naomi Watts learned how to speak Thai. I mean, it sounded exactly like Naomi Watts, and it was just amazing. Uh, Jack Black was a little different. He was a little off. He's very distinctive, so he was a little off. But I do know that in most countries, uh, there are certain voiceover people who are assigned to their English-speaking counterpart. So there are people in Germany who are assigned. So, for instance, uh, um, Leonardo DiCaprio. Well... This is what he sounds like in German. One guy always does Leo. Leo's voice doesn't change depending on, on who they get to do his movie. Uh, he sounds like that one German guy. 
and George Clooney and Matt Damon and uh, and uh, Sandra Bullock and on and on uh, have a certain sound. They are paired up with uh, voice people, and that's the way it is for a lot of countries. Um, so that they the uh, English speaking and American stars, their voice doesn't change from movie to movie. So. Uh, like I say, they're quite good at it, and I would have liked to have seen uh, Parasite in English. Um, you know, I'm reading the subtitles. Uh, a lot of people would be, be purists, but I think that goes back to the 50s when it was so bad. Um, it was so poorly done, but uh, these days it's, it's a real art, and um, I wouldn't mind. Okay, so... Uh, one of our very, very last films here is uh, also from this recent Oscars. These two movies were kind of up against each other, uh, 1917 and Parasite. And Parasite won, but 1917 won for cinematography. It is an amazing film. It takes place in World War I, which had lots of trench warfare. The Germans had advanced about as far as they could get, and then they dug in and the English and the French had pushed as far as they could, and then they dug in, and that's the way the war went for a couple of years. Uh, barbed wire and no man's land and trenches, and the setup is that the, uh, a section of Germans has been retreating. The British think they have them on the run. They want to finish them off in the morning, and the Germans have been laying a trap for them. They are laying in wait, and the English will be going into a meat grinder. So two young soldiers are going to deliver a very important message, telling them, and uh, coincidentally, the, the uh, uh, wires have been cut. Uh, it's just like uh, uh, today when um, uh, the cell phone coverage is out, okay? It's, it, it happens. Uh, at certain times, it's really for the convenience of the filmmakers uh, that the people that are being terrorized by the unseen whatever and no cell phone reception. So even going back to a World War I movie, the wires have been cut. And these men have to, these men, uh, have to take a message to the English, do not attack, do not attack. And uh, you need to get the message there by morning. And so there's a real time element in this. And it is done like one very long take. Now, we've already talked about one movie, um, the uh, Quaron film, Birdman. And, uh, but Birdman is set around one building in a theater, in a theater and, uh, and uh, the rehearsal halls and offices and things like that, and a little bit on the sidewalks outside. This is set covering quite a lot of uh, ground, quite a lot of territory and trenches and caves and and a river, and it's really spectacular. I've linked to a really excellent How They Did It documentary, and um, it's, it's really good. It's really good. So uh, check that out, and you might want to uh, might want to check the movie out, too, as soon as it comes on uh, streaming media or something like that, or maybe pick up the DVD. The director was Sam Mendes. That's him on the right. I would say, importantly, the cinematographer, and that is Roger Deakins there on the left, and he had the the uh, uh, not the honor, but he had the uh, the most Oscar nominations, most Oscar nominations without a win of any cinematographer. I think it was like eleven. He he had been nominated and lost eleven times, and then two or three years ago, he finally won for Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Uh, everybody's very happy. Everybody knows Roger in the Academy anyway. And uh, now, two years later, he won again. So fantastic. He's on a, he's on a real streak. He really deserved them both. Both of those movies, Blade Runner 2049 and 1917, are really outstanding cinematography. And uh, I think you'll really enjoy the, uh, the documentary, how they did it. So let's talk a little bit about business, the business of show business and, and movies. As I said, uh, most profit comes from outside of North America, and even North America, it's supposed to mean 
the United States. Uh, but the last time I looked on a map, Mexico was in North America, but they're not talking about Mexico because primarily they speak Spanish there. Uh, they're kind of talking about Canada, but even a big chunk of Canada, uh, Quebec, they speak French. So, <laughs> so when they say North American box office, they're talking about Canada and the United States. And 30% of the studio profit comes from that area. And 70% comes from the rest of the world. And that's why these big action movies, okay, uh, translate so well. Action is kind of easy to understand. We've already talked about translating slang and words like that, uh, moros peros and uh, hustle and things like that. Uh, action, right, chasing and fighting, running, chasing, fighting. Uh, it's pretty easy to figure out even when uh, even when Iron Man and Captain America are bickering, it, you can still kind of figure out what's going on. Otherwise, it's lots of lots of action, and that works well overseas. Everybody, the whole world loves that. They love it in Russia and China and India and everywhere else. So let's just call it ninety percent. Don't worry about ninety-four or ninety-three or ninety-one or whatever, but ninety plus percent of U.S. films are projected with digital projectors, and that is a big uh, re reversal. Probably 10 years ago, it might have been the opposite. Maybe 10 percent were projected digitally, or 6 percent, and the rest would have been projected on film projectors. But over the last 10 years, it has gone in a big way toward digital and digital cameras, the same thing. Uh, matter of fact, so far that Kodak had to get kind of bailed out by the film industry because they were about ready to go out of business. Uh, you know, if, if you've lost, if you've lost like, like 80% of the business, then you're in big trouble. Now check out this graph. It's really amazing. I just love it because it's so clear. Here is film. Here is film. 90 plus percent of all movies are shot on film as of about the year 2000 and it starts all the way up to 2008 and then we get this big plummet I don't know what tape I don't know why, why that's even in there but digital okay at whatever just a two percent back in 2000 and this is right about the time when George Lucas's second Star Wars uh, trilogy is coming out and George was one of those very few that was going digital and they go pretty flat for a while and then they start sharply going up around the same time these guys start going down connected for sure and right here in I don't know the middle of 2012 they are equal about as many movies are shot with digital cameras as are shot with film cameras and then they go in the opposite direction up flat out a little bit. Now digital is somewhere in the 90% range. This is a couple years ago. And film way down perilously uh, at uh, close to the 10% level, a little less than 10%. And it is so clear that all this stuff changed uh, like from 2010 to 2014 and this about four year period right here. All that changes. So a couple of terms, platforms is a way to put your product out there, okay? That is a business term, and uh, you might hear in the business press that the, the studio is conducting a multi-platform release strategy, okay? Doesn't that sound nice? Now, I know a lot of you aren't um, film or cinema studies majors, but even so, even if you're a business major or, or whatever, there are, it is a good career path. And if you want sort of the excitement of Hollywood and all that, and uh, you want something uh, maybe as a business major, there are uh, really, good, uh, really good careers in Hollywood, in the studio system and all of that, and in television, uh, in, in that uh, uh, business uh, path and um, producers, the, the producers uh, uh, team, I guess we'll call it the producers team. Now, now that's different than production. The producers team, they're the ones that work on the money, but they're the ones that help find the scripts. 
they are going to scout locations, they are going to get uh, location permits and hire the uh, security, they're going to make sure the food trucks are there, uh, get the contracts and everything ready for the, the actors, um, all that, right? That's all under the producer's team. So uh, again, you don't have to uh, carry cameras and lights and uh, do editing to work on movies, right? There's lots of uh, ways to work in the film industry or the entertainment industry if your uh, background is maybe in business. So I'm just putting that out there. Think about that just a little bit. So theatrical window, this is the big buzz term. That is how long it takes from a movie theater to everything else, let's call it, everything else, or home, home. Uh, streaming, VHS, DVD, whatever, right? Uh, uh, movie theaters and everything else. And The Irishman, uh, very famously, broke with that. Netflix has been a very disruptive force. Sometimes disruption is, is good. You know, it was a big disruption when, when the jazz singer at Talkie came in and uh, color and all that, so the new technologies and things. But in the case of Netflix, they are uh, not uh, treating the theatrical window uh, as uh, a sacred 90 days, which is normal, three months, a quarter, a quarter of a year. That is traditional. Movie theaters have been a big part of the film industry ever since their inception uh, 120 years ago. And now, uh, here comes Netflix and here comes streaming and all this other kind of stuff and it's not like uh, it's not like DVDs and VHS where it's going to play in the theaters and then three months later you can you can get it some other way. Netflix is barely waiting a month on some of these movies on The Irishman and uh, last year on Roma and theater owners of course don't like it and uh, now uh, and with the virus, uh, who knows uh, how this whole business model is going to play out? How this whole business model—it's a—it's a—it's a big change. I know we'll be back in theaters and things like that, but people are going to, in the meantime, going to get used to uh, not going to theaters. So that's a big disruption: uh, the theatrical window and Netflix. And they have had uh, a couple, actually, Roma from last year, The Irishman from this year, and I believe. Marriage Story, and there might even be a third one. I'm trying to remember if there's a third one or not, but those are the two famous ones as the uh, Best Picture nominated films from Netflix disregarding the theatrical window. They did buy a, a big historic theater in downtown LA, the Egyptian theater, where they can show their movies, but if they don't go for the full 90-day theatrical window, it will be a big disruption. Day and date is the term for a film being available in theaters and home on the same day. And that day is coming closer and closer. Not 30 days, but the same day. Uh, I know uh, some movies, due to the virus, that wanted to play in theaters, they couldn't do that. And they were offered within a week or two at home, but it was $19. I don't think that that is the kind of price that people are going to go really big for. Uh, now, you're pro it's not $19 per person. It's $19 for uh, that one usage. So if you invite three or four friends over uh, and everybody chips in three or four dollars, then you can watch you know, whatever it is. I would have to say a, it would have to be a really big movie, like a Marvel movie or a... Star Wars movie before people are going to want to spend the $19 for uh, watching it at home. And hopefully you've got a big giant TV and not just somebody's laptop, too. Day and date. And uh, a little bit more on business here. This is actually five big media conglomerates because we're going to drag and drop Fox over here to Disney. Okay, I can't literally do it, but basically we're dragging and dropping Fox over. Disney just picked them up, and uh, assets from 20th Century Fox, it will be arriving. So we're really down to five. 
Um, they are aligned with uh, television networks, CBS and, uh, and Showtime and uh, all of that. Uh, those films and uh, Paramount is the main film company. They've been around since forever. Comcast with Universal and NBC have paired up. Sony, uh, United Artists, MGM, and, uh, and they are uh, aligned with uh, uh, Sony uh, Television, Sony Pictures Classics, Sony Television, Columbia, okay, quite, quite a fair lineup. Warner Brothers and HBO, so they are going to be streaming pretty soon, HBO Plus. So, uh, former former enemies, now friendly and uh, conglomerates, right? That, the, these are big multinational conglomerates. Sci-fi, and, and we mentioned this a little bit earlier with YA, big on allegory. Uh, if you remember Animal Farm from uh, high school or 1984, uh, I would say Gene Roddenberry with Star Trek was big on allegory. Rod Serling's, uh, um, well, Night Gallery for sure and Twilight Zone were also big on allegory, sort of telling one story with aliens, but it's actually about race or something like that, and we saw with uh, Harry Potter and so on. I wanted to bring that up because uh, we're edging into uh, Marvel, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and X-Men, X-Men 2 in particular. Uh, it really has a subtext of coming out. There's a young, uh, uh, one of the young uh, mutants, and he's going to tell his parents that he is, and it looks like one of those uh, afternoon, after-school specials, where the young teenager is going to come out to his parents and tell him that he's, that he's gay, but here he's telling his parents that he's a mutant, but the whole thing is shot and plays with the kid and his parents and all that, uh, and the X-Men in particular, it's about being I guess you could say a persecuted minority. Okay, so it could be about being Jewish. It could be about being African American. Here, it was played out like being gay. Um, but that, as I said, that is one of the things that comics and um, uh, can do. And they've done other things, domestic spying. There's all sorts of uh, allegorical ways of tackling current events and things like that. And so now we are in to the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, you don't need to write this down. You know all this stuff. Uh, I'm not going to ask you, uh, is this part of Marvel or is this part of DC or anything like that, but I just want to kind of put that out there. The 21 films, I believe it is, in the Avengers saga. And they really were uh, second. They were sort of Johnny-come-lately. The big cinematic universe going back to the 1930s, was DC. Detective Comics, by the way, DC. Superman, Superman radio program in the, in the 1940s, Superman cartoons in the 1940s, there were Superman and Batman serials, and then Superman on TV in the 1950s, and the, uh, uh, I would say the start of the modern superhero movie began in 19... 78 with uh, Superman the movie. A uh, big uh, multi hundred million dollar type movie when you adjust for inflation. Uh, big effects, all that. Big stars. And uh, then a few short years later in the 1980s we get Tim Burton's Batman movies which were huge hits. Very big hits. And Marvel was just making cheesy Spider-Man TV shows and cheesy Hulk TV shows. And they weren't really doing too much until uh, the, uh, until 2000, uh, when when they went after what they thought were their uh, the big ones would be Fantastic Four and X Men, and nobody thought that nobody thought that uh, Iron Man or Captain America or Thor were really worth a bother. Uh, the, the big uh, the big Marvel ones were Spider Man and Hulk, uh, but they took it, they ran with it, and DC kind of got left in the dust. DC's most famous films, and they did, they did have some pretty big ones before Marvel really, truly took off. They had 
The Dark Knight. And The Dark Knight made a gajillion dollars from Christopher Nolan. And so DC thought that that was the, the formula, make these dark superhero movies like The Dark Knight. And The, the Dark Knight made a billion dollars at the box office way back all these like 10, 12 years ago. And they've been trying to work that recipe and it just hasn't worked. Uh, the Superman movie, Superman and Batman, even for the a large part of Justice League, although they started lightening it up a little bit uh, for Justice League, and everybody kept saying, they're not funny, we want funny movies, we like Avengers movies, we like Marvel movies, Marvel movies are so fun, we like Thor, and we like Ant-Man, and we, you know, we like those kinds of movies. And poor DC is thinking, yeah, but you used to like The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight made a billion dollars at the box office, and we're just trying that formula. And audiences' tastes changed. They just didn't like that quite dark movie uh, for their big, and Superman's supposed to be almost like a Boy Scout. He's supposed to be a, a you know, a cannot tell a lie kind of a guy. Batman, okay, fine. Batman is good with the dark, the dark movies, all that kind of stuff. Um, and Batman has been rebooted. Uh, that's wrong. It's thrice. that we Now we've got a new one. Robert Pattinson is going to play the Batman. Uh, and so now we've got a third uh uh, rebooting here of, uh, of Batman. In the meantime, if you need, and, and uh, sorry, Wonder Woman, much lighter, not quite as funny as, you know, some like Thor or Ant-Man, but definitely lighter. And uh, same thing for, uh, for Aquaman, much lighter than the dark uh, Batman and Superman movies were. DC seems to be doing much better on, uh, on television. And they really rule television. Marvel has struggled on television, uh, and DC has struggled in theaters. But if you're looking for dark, there is uh, there is a place, and that is this whole kind of new place for R-rated graphic novel comic books. They used to think, well, kids read comic books. You read comic books when you're, you know, 11, 12, 13 and so on, and they shouldn't be uh, R-rated, but they have done quite well. Deadpool movies and Logan and Joker have done extremely well, and so very interestingly, there is this place. Now, they haven't really thrown $250 million at an R-rated movie yet. That's really the key. These are low-budget superhero movies costing only $90 million. Okay, only ninety million dollars. Yes, about that for uh, like Deadpool or or Joker, or, or Logan. But it is an interesting place, and and they both uh, DC and Marvel have tried, and there uh, are probably more uh, that I'm not listing. But it is an interesting, um, very interesting. Uh, I kind of like it. It seems kind of natural when people, you know, drop the f bomb or something like that, or d blood spurting it seems like it's kind of natural like a like a war movie or something like that how can you not make an r-rated war movie but language for sure uh and uh and uh and joker uh with uh with uh best uh, actor and it seems to be a pretty good uh role two oscars for uh actors playing the joker and um and it's dark, 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 so who knows what'll be next, some Arkham Asylum or something like that. And for us, this all this leads in, by the way, all this leads in with Marvel and the DC and YA and Peter Jackson and all that, and that is all going to lead in to our last discussion on the history of CGI. So instead of covering them all individually, uh, I thought, I, uh, and it's so important, the big movies, the big budget movies today are released generally in the summer or spring and, uh, or maybe around Christmas, and they are expensive because they are heavy on CGI, not because they are Lawrence of Arabia and went off to shoot in Tunisia for a year. That's not why they're expensive. They're expensive because they are big, giant CGI 
uh, movies. So for our last class, we're going to do a, a history, a brief-ish history of CGI. And that would that will bring us uh, basically up to the present. So until then, Professor Dave Eccles signing off. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you next time.